In this lecture, we're going to cover multiple linear regression, which is part of the broader regression family of inferential statistics or analyses. And so we'll start with doing an overview of what multiple linear regression actually means. And then we'll talk about the statistical assumptions underlying multiple linear regression models. And we'll talk about statistical and practical significance in the context of multiple linear regression. So let's start with an overview of multiple linear regression. And so, as I mentioned, multiple linear regression is part of a broader family of regression analyses, which themselves are inferential statistics. So in other words, we're trying to infer something about a sample that comes from an underlying population. So we're making inferences about the population from the sample from which those data came. So our big question is, what type of regression are we going to specifically use? And there's numerous different types of regression. And in this class, we focus mainly on simple linear regression and multiple linear regression. In this lecture, we dive deep into multiple linear regression. And what the multiple means in multiple linear regression is that we're using multiple predictor variables to explain more variance in outcome variable. And also, this introduces a concept called statistical control, which we'll dive into a little bit more detail in just a moment. So when we're talking about multiple linear regression, we are talking about, as the name implies, a linear relationship. And so for that reason, we're interested in the linear relationship between two or more predictor variables and some outcome variable. So the minimum number of predictor variables you need to have a multiple linear regression model is two. So when we think about the equation that we'd use or the regression equation or formula, it'll usually be written something like this, where we have y, which is our outcome variable, so scores on our outcome variable, are equal to beta sub zero. And so beta sub zero, if we're talking about an unstandardized regression coefficient, means this is the y-intercept value here. And then we'll also have other regression coefficients, such as pictured here, b sub 1, b sub 2. And these correspond to each of the predictor variables. And you can think of these as the slopes or the regression coefficients or the regression weights. And so in other words, this is essentially how much these different types of these different variables are contributing to creating this linear relationship in relation to the outcome variable, which here is depicted as y. And so if you look all the way to the end of the equation, you'll see that little e. This represents our residuals, otherwise known as our error, or our residual error term here. And so this is any kind of error in our estimation of the data. So essentially, it's the extent to which whatever line of best fit or whatever regression equation we come up with to describe this linear relationship, the extent to which it doesn't perfectly predict every single case, this is going to be error. So as I mentioned before, when we use multiple linear regression, we have two or more predictor variables, we introduce this concept called statistical control. And so when multiple predictor variables are included in a regression model, the estimated model provides the partial regression coefficient or weight for each predictor while holding all other predictors constant that are in the, the model. In other words, you can think of this as being the net effect. So what this means is that if you have two predictor variables, each one is essentially predicting the outcome variable while holding the other constant. And so again, this is a process known as statistical control, or in other words, a concept known as statistical control. So you can think of statistical control as being an alternative to experimental control, and especially in situations when experimental control is not feasible or not possible. And so if you think about experimental control, this is when you have like an actual control group and you have an experimental design where you randomly assign people to different conditions and everything else is the same except for whatever it is that you're manipulating based on that control and that treatment condition that you might have. Now, that's pretty challenging to do in some organizational settings. And so for this reason, sometimes statistical control is the next best thing. So for instance, if you wanted to know the relationship between age and perhaps performance on an organizational assessment of some kind, you might control for something like vendor or gender as a separate variable within that model um, if you want to partial out the effects of gender in predicting those scores or whatever the case might be. So just like we can with simple linear regression, we can use both unstandardized or standardized regression coefficients. Now, Generally speaking, I, recommending, I recommend defaulting to unstandardized regression coefficients as these keep the variables and the interpretation in their original scale. So the regression coefficients or weights are interpretable in the original scales of the predictor variables and the outcome variable. 
Now, standardized regression coefficient, this is going to indicate that there's a stand, what the standardized weight or coefficient actually is. And in other words, this is how much a one standard, standardized unit increase in the predictor results in a standardized unit change in the outcome variable. And standardized regression coefficients, if you're taking that route, you're going to have an intercept value that is equal to zero. So typically, we ignore that y-intercept value. So with an unstandardized regression coefficient, we can still use that language of for every one standard unit increase in this particular predictor variable, we have a blank unit increase in this outcome variable. So again, the idea here is that we can use the original scaling of those variables as opposed to using standardized scaling. Again, this is, gets us a little bit more closer to the phenomenon that we're interested in. Okay, so let's talk about the statistical assumptions that underlie multiple linear regression. And so first is the assumption that cases, which in often case in our human resource context are gonna be employees, the assumption is that cases are randomly sampled from the underlying population. The second assumption is that the data are free of multivariate outliers. The third assumption is that the association between the predictor and outcome variables are linear. And that's an important one to remember because this is a multiple linear regression. We also have the assumption that there is no collinearity, sometimes referred to as multicollinearity, between predictor variables. More on that in a second. Also, we have the assumption that the average residual error is zero for each level of the predictor variable, and the assumption that the variances of residuals um, errors are equal for all levels of the predictor variables, and this is that assumption of homoscedasticity. Now, the last and final assumption is that the residual errors are normally distributed for all levels of the predictor variables. So let's now talk about statistical significance in the context of multiple linear regression. So let's assume that we're using null hypothesis significance testing and we're setting our alpha level at 0 0.05, two-tailed. And so what that means is if our p-value is less than 0 0.05, that's associated with a particular regression coefficient, then we conclude that there is a, that regression coefficient is statistically significant. If it is equal to or greater than that alpha value of 0 0.05, then we conclude that it is not statistically significant. So more specifically, what we're doing here is that if that p-value for that regression coefficient is less than 0 0.05, we are rejecting the null hypothesis that that regression coefficient for that predictor variable is equal to zero. And remember, this is while statistically controlling for the other predictors in that model. Now, on the other hand, if we have a p-value that is equal to or greater than 0.05, then we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis that that particular regression coefficient is equal to zero. In other words, we're concluding that regression coefficient is not statistically significant. And remember, this is also while con statistically controlling for the other predictors in the model, because we're talking about those partial slopes or relationships here. Now, we can also use confidence intervals as well to test for statistical significance. And if the confidence interval does not include zero, then we conclude that there is statistical significance. And the equivalent confidence interval that corresponds to an alpha of 0 0.05 is a 95% confidence interval. So let's use a couple examples here to illustrate the language that we might use and how to actually interpret statistical significance in the context of multiple linear regression. So let's assume that we have the first regression coefficient that's represented by B sub predictor here that the coefficient itself is equal to negative 1.42 and the associated p-value is 0.01. Now, assuming that the alpha is two-tailed and set at 0.05, that p-value of 0.01 is less than 0.05, so we would conclude that we can reject the null hypothesis that that regression coefficient is equal to zero. In other words, we conclude that that regression coefficient that's equal to negative 1.42 is statistically significant. And so, when the regression coefficient is statistically significant from zero, we would make sure that we also note that we're controlling for the effects of other predictor variables in the model. And so sometimes you'll hear language such as incrementally above the other predictors in the model or holding the other predictors constant or above and beyond the predictors in the other predictors in the model. So there's different types of language that we might use here to describe that. Now let's look at this second example here. Let's assume that this is part of a multiple linear regression model. And so one of the regression coefficients, let's say it's B sub predictor here is equal to 0.11 and the associated p-value is 0.06. Now that p-value is greater than 0.05. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that this is zero. So in other words, we are concluding that that 
predictor variable or that regression coefficient for that particular predictor variable of 0.11 is not statistically significantly different from zero. So in other words, we say it's not statistically significant. And so we would treat that as being essentially non-existent, that there's no relationship between that predictor variable and the outcome variable when controlling for the other predictors in the, in the model. So again, we want to make sure that we throw in that language when we're using multiple linear regression regarding the fact that we are controlling for the effects of other predictors that are present in that model. So let's assume that we have found statistical significance for a particular relationship. Well, how then do we interpret practical significance and effect size in the context of multiple linear regression? So first, it's important to note that an unstandardized regression coefficient, whether it's in a simple linear regression model or a multiple linear regression model, is not an effect size. If we want an effect size for a specific bivariate relationship that's being tested as part of a multiple linear regression model, then we would run a correlation. And this might be a separate step, or a correlation might come as part of the output from whatever statistical analysis platform that you're using. Now, there are standardized regression coefficients, but remember, in a multiple linear regression context, even if we're using standardized regression coefficients, it means that we're still controlling for other predictors in the model. So we're getting partial estimates here. So the variance is being partialed out. And so for that reason, we want to be careful not to interpret that as a direct bivariate estimate of the effect size. When you hear bivariate, just think two variables, and specifically the two variables in, con in question are going to be one predictor variable and the outcome variable. What is the effect or magnitude of that relationship? Now, if you do choose to run a correlation as an extra step, or maybe this comes in the output, remember that Cohen did offer some general rules for describing effect sizes for correlation coefficients. So please note, these are not for regression coefficients, which are those Bs or those betas. These are for correlation coefficients here. So a small correlation coefficient would be plus or minus 0 0.10. A medium would be plus or minus 0 0.30. And a large correlation coefficient would be R equal to plus or minus 0 0.50 around thereabouts. So another way that we can interpret practical significance for a multiple linear regression model is that we can directly interpret the R squared value for the model. And this is a fit statistic as well as an effect size when we talk about R squared. So R squared is a, uh, for a model is a model fit statistic and an effect size that can be interpreted as the proportion of percentage of variance explained in the outcome variable collectively by the predictor variables when we're talking about multiple linear regression. And so this is important. R squared in the context of a multiple linear regression model, because we have more than, or we have two or more predictor variables in the model, we're talking about the collective variance explained by all of the predictors in the model in relation to that outcome variable. So that's important to remember here. Now, when describing effect size for R squared, you can think that a small R squared is about 0.01, a medium is about 0.09, and a large is about 0.25. And so just think about that in terms of interpreting the collective variance explained by the predictor variables in relation to the outcome variable. Now, it's important to remember, too, that the R squared value itself has an associated test of statistical significance, or in other words, a p-value that's attached to it, which tests whether the amount of variance explained in the outcome variable by the focal model outperforms the amount of variance explained in the outcome in a null model. And what we mean by a null model in this context is a model where there's no predictor variables in it. So you just have the outcome variable. And so in that context, we're seeing whether or not there is essentially significant variance or incremental variance explained by the model with multiple predictor variables above and beyond a model that does not have any predictor variables. It might not sound like a very high bar, but it is something that we do. And this is a classic um, step that we take in order to test the statistical significance of an R-squared value. So generally, we don't interpret the R-squared value unless the p-value associated with it is, indicates that that R-value can be treated as a statistically significant improvement in fit above and beyond that null model. Because the R-squared value is a model fit statistic, we can also use it to compare other types of nested models, such as when we're adding more predictor variables to a model to see if one additional predictor variable explains an incremental and significant amount of variance above and beyond the other predictor variables that were already added to the model. And so that's a very good additional useful way that we can apply R squared as a model fit statistic. And as you recall too, it's also an indicator of practical significance interpreted as the percentage or the proportion of variance explained in an outcome variable by the predictor variables 
in the context of multiple linear regression. So let's drill down a little bit more into this concept of R squared and thinking about it in terms of variance explained. So let's imagine that we have our outcome variable that we're trying to predict. It's represented by this blue circle here. And so this is the conceptual space here for that particular variable. Now, let's say that we have one predictor variable, and this is represented by x sub 1 here, and that's represented by this red circle. And so we can see that there is some shared variance here. Now, whether or not that's a significant amount of shared variance remains to be seen. But we can see there's some conceptual overlap between the predictor variable x1 and the outcome variable y here. But look what happens when we add in a second predictor variable, thereby making this a multiple linear regression model. And the second predictor variable is x sub 2. And so what we'll see now is not only do we have both predictor variables overlapping somewhat with this outcome variable y, we also have overlap between predictor x1 and predictor x2. And so when you see this overlap just between those two variables, this is getting at that idea of collinearity or multicollinearity. So when we also see, when we shade in the region, regions like this, we can see that we can break it down to three different sections here when we have two predictors and one outcome. And we're going to walk through this because this will explain a little bit more about this idea about variance explained as well as the idea of partial regression coefficients or slopes. So together A, B, and C represent the combined variance explained by the predictors in this model in relation to the outcome variable. So collectively, those three areas represent the percentage or the proportion of variance explained. Now, A represents the amount of variance in Y uniquely explained by X sub 1 after controlling for predictor X sub 2, whereas C represents the amount of variance in Y uni uniquely explained by X sub 2 after controlling for X sub 1. Now, where things get a little bit tricky is that area B. So there's this fight over variance here, and this is where multicollinearity can become a problem. And so with multicollinearity, when you have overlap or correlation that is substantial between two or more predictor variables in your model, then you have that shared B space, or this space where there's this overlap between those predictors, which if they're associated with the outcome variable, means that they're going to be fighting for that same variance explained in that outcome variable. And again, it's called collinearity or multicollinearity. Now, some collinearity is going to be expected. So when we're talking about most phenomena within an organization, there's going to be some overlap. A lot of things correlate to some extent. But we do get concerned if collinearity gets to very high levels because it can make it difficult, as I mentioned, to separate the unique effects of the predictor variables from each other. And this can actually result in inflated standard errors, which results in making it more difficult to find statistical significance. And also, if collinearity is, collinearity is too high, it can actually point to the fact that maybe these two predictor variables are actually measuring the same thing or they reflect the same underlying construct. And so maybe it'd be more efficient to drop one of them and maybe pick a different predictor that is more unique. Now, there's different ways we can detect collinearity, or in other words, collinearity indicators. And common ones include tolerance, as well as VIF, which is referred to as the valence inflation factor. Now, valence inflation factor is actually just the reciprocal of tolerance. So if you know one, you can calculate the other. But these are two good indicators that you can use to try to understand, OK, what degree of collinearity do we have here? And is it potentially problematic? So in this lecture, we did an overview of what multiple linear regression is. Now, if you remember, what separates simple linear regression from multiple linear regression is that multiple linear, linear regression has two or more predictor variables predicting an outcome, whereas simple linear regression has just one predictor variable predicting an outcome. Now, both are focused on linear relationships, and we can derive um, a regression equation using our estimated model from both approaches. But the difference, again, is that multiple in multiple linear regression stands for the fact that there are two or more predictor variables. Now, in this lecture, we also went over the statistical assumptions that need to be met in order to run a multiple linear regression model and in order to interpret the findings with some degree of confidence and accuracy. Now, finally, we went over the concepts of statistical significance and practical significance in the context of multiple linear regression. So this wraps up the lecture on multiple linear regression.